Good evening, everybody. Welcome. My name is Claudia Schmuckli. I'm the Curator of Contemporary Art and Programming at the Fine Arts Museums. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to tonight's program, hosted by the Contemporary Support Council of the Fine Arts Museums. And uh, we have a great lineup of people here to talk about the NFT mania, which we're all witnessing at the moment. Um, I would just take a brief moment and to thank the Battery for hosting, in particular Matt Bernstein for organizing everything, and of course also our development team who has put this event together, Rosie, Helen, Claire, thank you all so much. <laughs> so let's start with the artist. Takeshi Murata is joining us from LA today. He's a, a wonderful artist who has an exceptional career working in video art and digital media and has recently embraced the NFT territory and uh, is here to share with us the artistic perspective of this new uh, frontier. Um, to his right is uh, Sanchan Saxana. He is a VIP, oh sorry, a VP, also a VIP, right? I mean, it's kind of both. I yeah, you're both. both. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Sorry. I won't take it back. <laughs> He's the VP of product at Coinbase. He is leading the team's um, integration new to, uh, of new blockchains on Coinbase. And he is helping the company to lead the chain charge in the nimble and exciting crypto economy. The other woman here on the panel, Sarah Wendell Sherrill. She's the co-founder of Lobos, a platform working to build out an equity-based management model for artists. And she's also an avid art lover and patron of the arts here in San Francisco. And we are incredibly honored to have Kevin Roos moderate this panel. Kevin is an award-winning technology columnist for the New York Times, and a New York Times best-selling author of three books, Future Proof, Young Money, and The Unlikely Disciple. Some of you may have known him from his regular appearances on the New York Times, the daily podcast series as well, where he has uh, reported extensively on NFTs. And not only that, he has actually himself minted an NFT of one of his columns. So he is both an avid observer, analyst, and producer of NFTs. So I couldn't imagine a better person to moderate this panel. Thank you so much. And herewith, I turn it off to you. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming out. Can I just say this is so much better than Zoom? <laughs> so much yes. better. Um, so as Claudia said, I, I am... Uh, uh, both a reporter on NFTs and crypto and all these things and, uh, and a, a, a producer of them. My uh, interest in this topic, I'll just explain quickly, uh, started earlier this year um, when I went to my bosses at the New York Times with a crazy idea. I said, I really want to report on what are these NFT things everyone's talking about, but what if I turned the column about the NFTs into an NFT and sold it and, and you know, auctioned the proceeds off for charity? And they said, excuse me, can you start over at the beginning? <laughs> uh, and I had uh, maybe a dozen meetings where I explained in great detail what I was planning to do. And then we minted the column as an NFT. And I thought, well, maybe some New York Times super fan uh, with some crypto burning a hole in their wallet is going to come along and pay a couple hundred dollars for this. And, uh, and my colleagues thought I was crazy. And uh, then I woke up the next morning and the bidding had climbed to $100,000. <laughs> and then it kept climbing. <laughs> and then in the last couple minutes of the auction, somebody bid $200,000 and, and then $300,000 and got all the way up to 350 ETH, which was the final selling price, which at the time was about $560,000. And um, today is about $1.6 million. <laughs> so. <laughs> So, uh, so the charity got a lot of money, very happy about that. I think I'm the only person in history to lose money on an NFT sale because I ended up paying the gas fees. Um, <laughs> so that was my, my introduction. And then ever since I, then, I've kept reporting on NFTs and I've learned that um, they make a lot of people very excited and a lot of people extremely mad. 
Um, I, I get more hate mail for writing about NFTs, I was telling these guys before, than I did when I wrote about neo-Nazis. Um, and, uh, and they seem to be very, very polarizing. So I wanna dive into all of that. Um, but I wanna start by reading um, three uh, tweets that I, I pulled off of, uh, the internet about NFTs today. One of them says, how are, how are NFTs not just like naming a star or adopting a dolphin, but for grown men with too much money instead of eight-year-old children? <laughs> Number two says, in olden times, to scam a rube out of his coin purse, you had to pretend to be the valet of an imprisoned vis viscount and slowly bring him into your confidence. Today, you just show him a picture of a monkey in a sweatshirt and say something about the blockchain. Art is dead. <laughs> the third one is my favorite from, from The Onion. Uh, this is the headline. NFT investor reminds skeptics everything else in world stupid and meaningless too. <laughs> so, so, uh, so I wanna just start with Claudia, I want to throw it back to you because you are the, the representative from the, the institutional art world here. Um, how is this happening at museums? What are people talking about? What do those conversations sound like? Um, if I'm having trouble explaining this to my bosses at the New York Times, I imagine that you are also having a lot of uh, conversations with confused people in the art world. Indeed, I mean, it's been one of the uh one of the most hotly debated issues as of late because of course um, the art world suffers from terrible FOMO and doesn't want to miss out so <laughs> there's a moment where you know we realize there's a new phenomenon that is that has a lot of really interesting trajectories um, both you know in terms of creating equity transparency um, for artists and, and collectors and, and the galleries if they choose to collaborate with artists, but also uh, there's a lot of obscurity about how it all operates. I mean, just just creating a sort of a level of understanding of, of what this new phenomenon is that we're dealing with, I think is something that uh, that we're certainly still grappling with institutionally and uh, and that we are just at the beginning of unpacking for ourselves. And this panel is a perfect occasion to do so and to to work with you know people who are actively engaged in the space to develop a better understanding of of uh, sort of all the different facets and opportunities and threats and you know like uh, to really go deep and uh, and bring that back to to our constituents to our patrons but also to to have an informed information amongst the staff mm -hmm. and Sarah, you also spent time in the traditional art world. You were at Christie's, right, in the early part of your career. Um, and now you run Lobos, which can you just explain to us what you all are doing and how it ties into NFTs? Can I just have you talk about what happened today, though, with the Constitution Dow? I know we're jumping sure. ahead. Sure, we can talk about it. <laughs> Everyone know this story? That they're, uh, 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 and group. then I'll, I'll answer your question. I okay. Well, but but this is that. like there's like a um, historic thing happening today. Yeah, today is a which big I think day in the, the world of, of auctions. Um, a group uh, called the Constitution DAO, which is what's called a decentralized autonomous organization, um, put a bid in for $40 million on a copy of the U.S. Constitution. They were trying to buy the Constitution. It became this whole meme. <laughs> Um, they raised all this money, the sort of big crowdfunding campaign, eventually lost uh, just before this event. They, they were outbid by someone. If any of you are the high bidder, congratulations. Yeah, speak up, <laughs> we want to know. Um, there are a lot of people on the internet who are very mad at you right now. Um, so yeah, it was this huge viral thing. Um, and, and sort of, I, I wanna get back to that because I do think it, it um, is going to become a pretty big deal in the world of art and collecting, um, this ability that people now have to just aim a, a, you know, a bazooka filled with money at anything <laughs> um, through things like DAOs uh, just seems to be really new and, and really interesting. So well, now so back I'll, to you. But I'll go back, because so I worked at Christie's, which is, you know, not Sotheby's, but same, same. And um, this was a very familiar, you know, sort of sale, right? Like we sold the Magna Carta, we sold copies of important documents, and I'll get to art in a second. Um, and, you know, this project is like just so um, powerful 
and I think we were talking about this earlier, but it, it caught wind, what, five days ago, really. Like five days ago, a sale was coming up at Sotheby's in a very normal fashion, um, and a group got together and said, you know, why is the Constitution owned by one person? Like, can we all get together, pool funds, you know, I think you contributed, well, no, I don't know if you did. No, no I shouldn't say that on the record. I did not contribute, okay, sorry. I was not allowed sorry. to. Sorry, no, no, sorry. <laughs> um, but, you know, it started, like, it was a couple hundred thousand dollars. People were like, well, and the bid was at 15 million. Like, you know, that seems like a long shot. And within four days, this collective had raised um, something to the tune of $46 million. And they, you know, it's very interesting to watch. And, you know, they basically had to go through lots of regulation to register to bid because they were not a centralized LLC or organization. Um, they finally figured that out. And they were ultimately outbid. Um, and there's a lot of sort of angry constituents saying, you know, like, well, where is our backstop? Could we have more bidding? And these are the mechanisms that are so interesting and powerful. And I think as it goes back to the work that we do, um, at Lobus, which is, you know, really about the, this moment where creators are in control, um, where they are community building, you know, and I, and I come from the traditional art world, so and I love it deeply, um, but it is a very one-to-one -one relationship, right? An artist has a network of the only number of buyers and institutions that actually can purchase their work, and so if you're a prolific artist, that's fantastic, but if you're, you know, you're kind of capped at a thousand, right, really, of an audience, museums play a vital role in that. And the, you know, the power of the NFT is really like reaching a broad community, a broad audience. Um, we have an artist that, um, well, one of, Lucian Smith, who just joined our team this fall, who's an incredible artist, for those of you who don't know him, might look up his work. And he's doing um, an amazing NFT drop in the next month, which he'll, he'll mint, you know, 10,000 NFTs to the scale that you don't have in sort of physical works. Um, so I'm really excited, you know, one, from an economic relationship, and we can get into that later today, um, from a community building perspective, from an access. And this whole concept of ownership, um, which again, we can dig into in terms of what that means for Web3, but you know, you as the artist should be the most central owner of their work. Um, and collectors, you know, sort of enthusiasts, whatever we wanna call this word that we have today, I mean, I don't know what you call the constituents of the DAO um, community, um, they are active participants in the sort of creators. Um, and I think it's like just a whole new world that we are jumping into, which I think is really exciting. And I remember a few years ago, there was all this sort of hand-wringing and angst about the fact that all these people who were making all this money in tech weren't buying art. Like they were, they were you know, the galleries were like, we can't get these people interested in art. And it turns out, they are interested in art. Very. They're spending a lot of money on art. It's just that the artists that they're paying for are not Renaissance painters. They're, you know, JPEGs of monkeys and <laughs> and, and copies of the Constitution. Um, so I wonder, Takashi, if you could just, because you are the artist here, you have actually created uh, NFTs and, and sold them. And I wonder if you could just sketch out for us how you got there and, and what it was like for you to sort of try your work in, in this new medium. Yeah, thanks. Um, it was amazing. I mean, I, I, I started, I, I guess I started a fit, like selling video as limited editions about 20 years ago now. It's been a, a while. So, and my, the first place I showed was here in San Francisco at, at Ratio 3 Gallery. Uh, we were able to make, I think I was still making work on VHS tapes. And it was like, and we'd make this certificate and sell this physical work. And, and that was how I started. And so it, that's kind of progressed over time to this point, the last couple that we had made, we were, pretty, we were kind of trying to figure out how to work the, f the physical side of it, if it made sense to have the, this, these things that are digital, and I, I was always producing them as videos that existed as videos, um, if they were gonna be on a USB stick, or what, what was the technology that we could really put these on, and that, that was getting more challenging to figure out as everything was going to the cloud, and all these things were um, no longer physical. Um, and, and then over the, just in the last, I think in May, uh, I started to find everybody was 
who I hadn't heard of, like I hadn't heard from friends that for years and they were writing me off people and like being like, what are you doing? You're, this, is your, this is your thing, you gotta get on this. And I, so I kind of started researching it and I realized that it, in a very fundamental first way of getting into it is very similar to what I've been doing with the galleries of a, the NFT being this uh, certificate of authenticity, but instead of it being um, backed and, and the, 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 the um, trust being placed on the person issuing it, which would be in the case, this case, the galleries that I was working with, um, it was, the trust was through the encryption and through this, this thing that was un, that could not be manipulated. So uh, I, I did my first, um, I made my first NFT, which was just a video and, and the contract. And I, I, I sold it through a marketplace called Foundation, which is the first place I worked with. Uh, and it was, it sold, it was incredible. How much did it sell for? I think it sold for 11 ETH, which at the time, and it was nice, it was, I mean, the, the whole thing going up was very nerve wracking because I thought this could kill my art career if I put this up and like no one bids on it, then what, what happens? You know, it's so public. You're like an imposter put an NFT up uh, yeah. pretending to be me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was not me. <laughs> exactly, I should have thought of that. Yeah. But uh, so it was very, I mean, in that side of it, it was really stressful. And, and uh, since then, I've learned that a lot of those art rules. And 11 ETH now is like what, like $50,000 or something it's like that? It's gone up, yeah. yeah. But it, before it, it went down 50%. So when I first got it, <laughs> I was really excited. And then I just kind of, I think it, I think it was a week later, it was 50% around there of what it was. And so I was kind of casually browsing like the do, IRS. And do you still like, have it? I get, yeah, I did, well, I kept it. You kept yeah. it? Yeah, I did. I kept, at that point, I thought I was a complete fool for keeping it, but then it did, it has come back, so that, that's good, but, um, but yeah, I was like, I, I realized that it was this thing, I, I had made this great sale, and then it had basically made a terrible investment. I, I realized from the IRS that it was the money, I think it's seen as property, so when it sold at 40000 that was considered a $40,000 sale. And then I just left it in ETH and it dropped up by 40%. So I made like a really bad investment with all the money I had made from that as far as the IRS goes. But um, I also had a lot of very confused conversations with accountants after my NFT sale. And there was a moment where I thought I was going to have to book like a million dollars worth of capital gains on my personal taxes. <laughs> we figured it out. But... Um, if you are any crypto accountants over there, you guys are in a good business because these yeah. are, questions are not uh, simple. I could use your, their help too. <laughs> Mine, mine's still all Google, so I'm just yeah. going with they, what I learned. But um, yeah, so anyway, so, so it, just, it was immediately this exciting, scary thing and, and then ultimately uh, great and helped me then produce work that I've been wanting to produce for years through that, through that money that I'd earned from the sale. And Sancha, I wonder if you're on the sort of technical product side of this, and I wonder if you know you could just give us a quick overview of kind of the case for NFTs, because I think we 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 hear, you know, this is a Ponzi scheme, this is you know these are scams, these are all you know this is a bubble, they're horrible for the environment. I mean, we hear all of this, and and we're, we'll we'll talk about some of that, but I I wonder if you could just sort of give us like the case for why NFTs or something that you're paying attention to, why there's something that Coinbase is paying attention to, and kind of like what is the what is the what is the the advocate case? Yeah, happy to. I think what I believe is that every new technological innovation has helped unleash a new creative form. And that new creative form has then forced the technology to evolve even further. So it's like a good relationship between technologists and artists, you know, and we help each other build these things on. So when I look at NFTs, I think of the technology it provides amazing benefits to the artist first and foremost. Then we'll talk about the collectors. On the artist side, I think, as you all know, when you sell something for the first time, uh, the value is in the eye of the beholder, right? If you think about Bitcoin, if you think about any cryptocurrency, it's because a bunch of us believe this is valuable. As a result, it's valuable. If a bunch of us believe this is important art, it will become art as well. However, there was never a mechanism for the creators to benefit from it in the long term. So for example, when you sell it for the first time, that's pretty much it. If, if someone sells them the secondary markets, you don't benefit from that relationship, right? So what NFT, the technology is allowed to do is it has allowed the creator to build their own community and have a direct relationship with them and cut out the intermediary. Sometimes the intermediary could be a museum, some kind that could be a YouTube, or sometimes that could be some other company that is in between. So this is the exciting part of NFTs where if your art can be expressed in digital form, and by the way, 
NFTs are not just for art. They can be extended to anything. But let's talk about art for a second. If NFTs is the technology for enabling artists to express themselves, then they also allow the artist to build an incredible community around the world because the distribution is almost free. You can distribute it everywhere. And two, over time, you continue to benefit from the community's interaction by resale of those NFTs within them as well. So that relationship never existed, and it's pretty powerful. So that's very exciting. And what about the argument that, oh, you're not actually buying the, the art, you're, you're not, you know, somebody can go save, right click and right save, click save. Yeah. Um, and you know, I can have a CryptoPunk right now if I want to. I, what, is the, what is the argument uh, yeah, from the other question. side of that? Yeah, so you can absolutely right click and save. In fact, the joke is so much that there are Twitter accounts that says right click and save. You know? uh, so, so the thing that you're right click and saving is something that will not uh, bear to you the privileges of actually owning it. So what I mean by that is, imagine the Board Ape Yacht Club. In the NYC NFT event, they hosted their own event. And if Board Ape Yacht Club is a, is a, is a, is a might need some clarification collection of uh, NFTs of monkeys, of apes. <laughs> um, apes, yes. Right. It's sort of a social club that is formed yes. around those. They throw parties. They have events. They, they all are getting rich off these NFTs. That's right. And as an example of that, what, what's happening through that is that you can, of course, right click and save that, that ape, but you will never, because you cannot prove your ownership of that, as a result, you will never have access to the community events, to the community participation that was happening if you were an original owner of that. The way I think about that is it's an access, it's a community driven access, it's community driven ownership, and as a result, you're part of the artist and the community together in ways that was never possible. If I right click and save, I cannot prove to Takashi that, hey, I'm the real owner because the blockchain is the only place to prove that you are the real owner. And that technology that can, uh, the certificate of authenticity that you were talking about, that now lives permanently on the blockchain. And if you right click and save, you cannot prove that certificate of authenticity. So NFTs is basically digital rights management in some ways, you know, digital ownership management in some ways, and in a simplified way rather. And what that allows you to do is claim the benefits of being part of that community claim the benefits of connecting with other people and the artists and continue to support the artists and ways that were just not possible before. Claudia, I want to ask you about uh, something I read today. It was, I was reading some uh, NFT statements from artists, and I, I read this thing from uh, an artist called Trevor Jones, who's in the UK. He's, a, he's an NFT artist. And he was talking about why he has shifted from doing shows at museums and galleries to almost exclusively doing NFTs now. And he said, what can a commercial gallery do for me? Having a gallery exhibition, I worked a year creating paintings. I paid for all the framing, the overhead for the studio. I had the paintings delivered to the gallery. I may or may not sell. The gallery takes a 45, 45 to 55% commission, and they might pay out a month or six weeks later. And now I sell something, and three minutes later, I've got the money in my digital wallet. So do NFTs kill the museum and the gallery? Is that where this is going? I hope not. <laughs> I do hope that they can coexist. Um, and I also think he's, you know, he probably has a terrible gallery. <laughs> <laughs> if, that is, if that is the reality he's faced with. But no, I mean, I think, you know, we are, what I find exciting about the NFTs is, is the degree to which it empowers artists. And, you know, I think that is just a reality that the institutions of art, whether they are galleries or the, whether they are museums, have to uh, take into account as we move forward. Um, it also depends whether or not the artist, how deeply an artist, let's say, is invested in the physicality of, up, of an object. And, you know, there are many, many forms of art that really benefit from the NFT phenomenon, um, including digital practices. I would also argue conceptual practices and performative practices who have historically uh, lagged behind in, in the marketplace of, of the arts because they have been historically undervalued comparatively. They never, uh, they never were able to realize the same kind of sales prices that paintings or sculptures were. So I, I recognize that that is an enormous opportunity for artists and they should take it, you know? And it will force the traditional art market to follow suit eventually. And I think that's 
that's not necessarily a bad development. And um, but I would I, I would still argue that there are many people, artists and viewers and collectors alike, who who are equally invested in sort of a, an IRL experience of an of an art object. I mean, we're looking back at centuries of histories of making, where we feel that the arts have a unique ability to make ideas physically experiential in ways that may not always translate into into a digital realm, but they can coexist. And so I I wouldn't say that we're looking necessarily at an either or, but at an at an expanded sort of um, territory of art experiences that uh, that are embraced, you know, by at the moment probably by different types of audiences, but that there's not to say that that couldn't, you know, segue into a sort of more integrated audience for art across platforms. So that's to your point in terms of art galleries relevant, you know. Um, and also I think it depends to what extent it's, again, speaking from an artist's perspective, artists want to want to be part of the history of art and the the traditions of of visuality and invention of visual languages that have formed the many histories of art that we're looking at today because we all know there is not one history of art but that we're looking at a plurality of histories of art with different traditions both material you know I, uh, iconographically ideologically and so to what extent an artist wants to participate and respond and be part of that conversation, I think, will also play a big role in terms of how, how this conversation is being put forward, you know. Um, and I recognize that there are a lot of artists in the crypto realm right now. I mean, like uh, the creators of, um, of the punks, for example, that, that may not care about that history and that's fine you know and and they will have sort of their own community as you say because it's it really struck me to realize how important community and identity i mean these two notions are so tied up right with the crypto art movement or whatever you want to call it um and so i guess it defines to you know it, it really depends who do you want to talk to who do you want to be in dialogue with and so it's again it's not one or the other but can we talk about like the physicality and digital? Because I think yeah, that I'd this is because I think this is where it's so expansive. And you know what is an NFT, right? It's like a whole list of a hundred things, and it's not just one. And I think what Claudia is talking about. I mean, we have an artist right now who is using NFTs as a sort of token to for physical paintings. Right, so that he can retain 20% of equity on those paintings and sort of stay connected to his buyers. Explain how that works. Well, we're figuring it out as we speak. <laughs> but um, this is, you know, it's, fract it's, it's fractionalization in a different way, but I think it's with the goal of this, you know, an artist who has a great relationship with his sort of collectors, um, who they want him to be incented and to be retaining ownership. And so there's no way to, you know, the sort of royalty, we can get in a whole conversation about royalties in the physical art world, which is NFTs have shown the possibility and I think have given the permission for creators to say, hey, listen, this is, you know, I'm an owner. Um, what does that structure look like? I'm building community, right? I'm gonna have a direct dialogue. Like the greatest thing about sort of NFTs as a, as a token or as a, a unique, you know, whether it's board apes or whether it's um, a work that you're creating, you know, you now have direct access. Like they know who you are and you know who they are and you can talk and you can communicate. And is it is it a contract? Is it a certificate of authenticity? Is it a museum membership? Is it a piece of digital art? Is it stoner cats and you know access to watching a TV show like these are all the the amazing applications some are physical some are digital and I think we're gonna see right because you can bundle you can say whoever buys this NFT that's right will also access. get X Y and Z in my case when I sold my NFT I said whoever buys this NFT will get uh, a voice message from Michael Barbaro the host of the daily um, <laughs> And so you can do that with 
things like a physical painting, you could say this yeah. is your physical painting too. Yeah. I want to ask you about the, the who of NFTs. So uh, I went to an NFT.NYC, the big uh, convention in New York a couple weeks ago. A lot of guys, a yes. lot of men. Yes. A lot of there. men who look like I was me. there. And, uh, and there's been some... Uh, there was a study out a few weeks ago that, that said that something like 95% of, of NFT um, artists are men um, and that three quarters of the profits in NFTs go to men. Um, you know a lot of people in this space. Is that true? Is this just a bunch of dudes? I think there are amazing women in the space. and But I think there's a... Listen, I like to say that I think... Uh, crypto has a big language problem. Like it's a very, um, you know, it needs like a good PR firm to come through. Um, there's one they email in, me every There's day. one sitting in the room. And um, to, you, don't you know, like I gas? You don't like the gas? You know, no, I, I, like, I like gas. I like minting. I like all of that. But I think even the shift from talking about blockchain and crypto to Web3 has like normalized this conversation, right? And I think there are you know, there is a, there's a bridge that needs to be crossed. I think a lot of the early adopters, the frontier builders of crypto, you know, and we can get into a whole gender conversation, but I think, you know, is largely male centric. I think the conversation, but actually how do you build community? How do you think about things? I mean, I think, I think it's, I think there's a lot of really great projects that are gonna come out of that. Um, and I think there are a lot of amazing female storytellers, creators, um, and I'm kind of excited to see where that space goes. What could help that? What could help sort of bring more diversity to this world that is so heavily male? Other than new language and stopping talking about decentralized maybe, autonomous maybe organizations. Maybe not raves like at three o'clock in the morning in Times Square. <laughs> that was like, I was like, no, no, that, I'm gonna, that's not for me. Um, but no, I think it's it's shining, I mean, I think one, I have to say, like, it all goes back to those projects need to be capitalized by, there aren't a lot of crypto investors out there, right? And I'm, you know, I'm seeing that rise and I think it's amazing. Um, I think that's a part of it. Um, I think there is, you know, visibility. I mean, the art world has a, also that problem, right? I mean, it's who's selling at Christie's, you know, you run the math and it's 80% male. Um, so I think it's visibility. I think it's people like Claudia. I think it's a panel like this that actually has a woman on it, um, uh, women. Um, and, um, and I think those are, but I think it's vital. I think this is what's incredibly exciting about the internet is anybody can participate. Um, and the, theoretically, yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Sorry. Theoretically. Yes. Yes. Um, but it's a great question. Uh, and Sanchan, can you just clear up this environmental question for us? Because I get this every time. Every time I write about NFTs, I get a hundred people emailing me saying, "You are personally Kevin Roos killing the planet," um, because NFTs. Every time you mint one, you know, a thousand trees get cut down or whatever it is. Um, and I cannot find good information on this. There seems to be all these conflicting reports about how much energy is required to mint and transfer NFTs. So what is the real story of the environmental impact of NFTs? Yeah, it's a great question. Something that we at Coinbase have published, actually a lot of information on our website as well. There's a similar myth about Bitcoin, uh, that it, if you buy Bitcoin, you sell Bitcoin, you're also doing the same thing. So I think that it, we have to first understand how this works, and then we can address the question, is it killing the environment or not? So if you think about the blockchain, the first generation of blockchains that came about that unleash all of this stuff, of course, have some limitations, just like with any technology. If you guys remember the internet, back in 1980s and 1990s, we could not dial up and watch a, a Netflix movie on your phone back then, right? But now the same thing can be done on a phone very easily because the technology has evolved. So there is, what I would say is, the, the new generation of blockchains that you're thinking about, like the proof of stake blockchain, you might have heard of this term a lot, they are environmentally friendly in the sense that they, are, they use less energy, they use less uh, computing power, and the trend lines are such that it is headed in the right direction, but over a period of time, as more and more users join the NFT ecosystem, 
we don't see trend lines going up, rather we see them stabilizing because just because the load increase doesn't mean the technology is not able to sustain that. So I would argue there's a lot of information out there, but you're right, there's a lot of myths out there as well. The technology is evolving rapidly and it is not killing the environment, rather it is, is, it's getting more and more green. If you look at the Bitcoin Association as an example, and then the Ethereum Association as well of miners, they are actually using clean and renewable energy to actually power some of those mining machines as well. So over time, you will see this getting better and better. But today, there is some truth to it, but a lot of that is just FUD, and you, you just have to dig into deeper. But there is some truth to it, right? right? Because the proof of work blockchains, the Bitcoin and Ethereum right now, and, and you know, which I think represent like 95 plus percent of all crypto transactions, they do require an enormous amount of energy to run. So right. if we just, if, if we just ignore the sort of proof of stake, you know, the, the sort of blockchain by blockchain questions, how much does me minting an NFT um, and selling it contribute to the energy problems that we know that Bitcoin and Ethereum have? Yeah, I think uh, it'll be, I don't have the hard quantified number, but there's a lot of research being done around when you run a transaction on Ethereum, for example, how much compute power is used as a result of that, how much heat and energy is dissipated around that. Uh, and all of those trends are true that there is enough amount of energy being generated. However, I don't have the exact number, but what I would say is the trend lines are such that those energy consumptions are going down as more and more. Uh, miners are coming online and using renewable energy. But I would also say I think this is where like capitalism is actually going to solve for the, right. the environment. Like because as users of different chain, different chains are going to cr be created that are more energy efficient. Other chains will get left behind, and whoever is behind those chains, like if they don't solve for this, they're going to lose that volume. And so to me, it's like I mean we talk about it a lot at our company. But I think the, and it's obviously something that matters deeply to especially the artists that are really producing on chain, but I think it's like this is, then you hear see another chain pop up. And I think this is where some of the smartest people in the world are working on how to make this more efficient. I mean, how to make it much more, um, and, and I think you're gonna see, I mean, you've seen massive leaps in, in that since what, March. Um, and I think it's exciting, yeah. people like. I did find there's a website where you can plug in your your uh, crypto wallet address and it will tell you how much carbon you are personally responsible for <laughs> offsetting. And so I did. I felt guilty enough that I did buy some offsets on my carbon. But I don't. I never know what those things are. Like, That's right. are they planting a tree? Are they? You know, what are they doing with that? I don't know. It just it's my my penance for uh, for whatever damage I cause. Um, uh, Takashi, I wonder if you hear about these concerns from other artists. You were saying earlier in the in the green room that there are sort of hot debates between artists about whether NFTs are good or bad or responsible or irresponsible. So can you give us a sense of how the artists that you know are are thinking about NFTs? Yeah, there. I would say to fin the, also in the the main one of the main chains blockchains that people use is Ethereum, and one of their main one of the things they're moving to is away from the proof of work into proof of stake, even to like where I've, I've, on Coinbase, I've staked some right. Ethereum for the 2.0 transfer. So that, that is, is, a, is a, I'd say that's an early technology that's getting resolved. And I think it is something that can be resolved. And, and Ethereum will have that resolved, they, they said, by the beginning of next year. But there's also, for, there's also um, right now, there's, there are things, that, other chains that are smaller and that, that are really exciting communities um, that are working with proof of stake right now, like um, Tezos is a chain that has this really incredible um, marketplace called Hick and Nunk that was, because it's... What's that, what's that name again? It's Hick and Nunk. It's, it is a crazy <laughs> okay. name. Uh, I think it means here and now. And, and I, here I and now. Yeah. And it's shortened to Hen. And in preparation for this, of course, it the 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 owner of it or the person running this centralized marketplace pulled it and just uh, on Twitter it just says discontinued. <laughs> this and this is like uh, I'd say hundred thousands of users, uh, tons of users to artists, collectors, and a lot of a lot of uh, people collectors putting a lot of money into it, a lot of um, Tezos and. Uh, but the incredible thing, this, and this, I'm just bringing this up because this happened, I think, two days ago as I was like talking about other parts of why this chain is good. Um, but then it was an open source project. As far as I understand, all that code for the actual marketplace was able to be mirrored and brought back. And because all of that work was on chain and decentralized, 
it didn't matter that the first the person who created all of this through their their marketplace brought all these artists and collectors together just because that disappeared it didn't make the artwork disappear it didn't make those contracts the people who owned it that's all still there and immediately it got back up to being live and almost i think almost identical to how it was but it's a little bit of a sidetrack but that that community uh because it was much much less expensive there were no, there were almost no uh, environmental impact at all with the proof of stake. Uh, it was really vibrant and is very vibrant. And you could go, like, I, I, I've started collecting, I would go, you know, you could, just you look at these artist sites and an artist can sell something for one Tezos or si about $6 and sell 100 of them, make $600, you know, which for a starting out artist is great, but be it zero, which was <laughs> like my starting out, you know, and then, then th th that gets to all their, that work goes to a hundred different collectors, and those are, collectors are often other artists, and it just kind of perpetuates this way. And you can dig into like artists that you like, look at their collection, see what they've collected, find out. It, it really is an amazing way to find new work. Um, so that was an alternative, and is an alternative. I keep saying was, but is it has transformed in the last twenty four hours. But. And and how does how does the innovation of NFTs change the actual art? I mean, I imagine that when you're thinking through a piece and what you want to make next, you're thinking, okay, is this going to be, it's probably not going to be a VHS uh, tape anymore, it's probably going to be an NFT, but how do you think the, the sort of being able to see the whole marketplace and what's selling and what's not and how much and being, having had a couple successes under your belt, does that change the way you actually approach like what you're making and, and how you're making it? It has, it has, the technology is really exciting and so a lot of it, like I got into another project that was, um, it's called Art Blocks, and it's this generative art um, uh, technology where you, when you, you actually make the work, it lives on the chain itself, and when, when you, a collector buys it, the work is generated at that moment. So you're basically putting in parameters and variables that will make themselves, you'll, they'll discover it when the work is created. And this is something that I had never thought about. I, I was a fan of generative art before, but it's mostly through music and other forms that were, I, I had seen that way, and so um, that that technology itself, just the smart chain, I'm, I'm very doing the very top level basic description of this, but um, it, it it opened up another way of making generative work that's really exciting. People can collect it. It's you can you know, um, and uh, I guess just it opened up like a whole other way of creating work that I hadn't thought of before, and and maybe didn't exist before the blockchain. I'm wondering. A question I get about NFTs a lot and crypto in general is, is this a bubble? And I'm, I'm not sure who, which one of you wants to answer this, but <laughs> I would love to hear someone's uh, explanation of whether or not you think we're in a bubble with NFTs specifically. I was at this conference in New York and I was talking to this guy and, and, uh, and he was saying he was a, an investor and, he, and I was like, oh, is, you know, what do you think of all this? And he's like, oh, this is like one of the biggest bubbles I've ever seen. He's like, we have the tech bubble of 2000 the housing bubble of 2007, and zero regulation. He says, I'm terrified of what happens when this market turns around. So you hear that kind of thing sometimes, and I'm wondering if you all think that the environment we're seeing right now with people paying millions of dollars for board apes and crypto punks and, um, and other NFTs, like, is this gonna last? Is this all gonna end horribly for people? Where are we gonna be a year or two from now? What do you think? You allowed to answer that? I'm a journalist. I don't have I, opinions, I, but I, uh, no, I mean, I, I think, um, I think even the people who are very bullish on NFTs, um, are, know that there's a lot of sort of money floating around in the market right now. There's, you know, the supply of NFTs is just so high. There's so many out there. Um, and I, I don't, I don't think anyone expects this to sort of continue forever, but then you hear people who say, you know, this is just the beginning. We're still early and this could all keep going. So it feels unsustainable to me, but I'm, there's a reason I'm not, you know, a, an NFT speculator. Um, I don't know. What do you think? Well, I'll take, I mean, I think, so I'll go on the side of I think we're just at the beginning. Um, now, do I think that, like, a cartoon is going to be worth, you know, $20 million. I, I like, there's a lot, there are a lot of experiments that are happening right now. And, but I think if you start with the premise, like if, if you do agree that there should be a global currency, 
right? Something that isn't governed by one organization. And I think if you can start at that premise and you then if you ask like, are our lives digital? And is there sort of an extension of brands and experiences and, and community that's digital? Um, like what are the mechanisms that really start to facilitate that? If you think about work being created and um, you know, trustless systems of passing ownership and title, like I, I believe that we'll buy our cars on NFTs one day and our houses and our title will sit in our Apple wallet and that's, you know, will be very normalized. Um, you know, I think like what's happening now is there are a lot of factors, right? Like people that have had Bitcoin since 2013, um, the big speculative assets going on, trading, like sitting at home, like all of those factors, like maybe that, but I think, I think it hits a whole nother level when it starts to um, become a real infrastructure product that we can all trust and, and move. How many NFTs do you own? So this is my gripe, and I'm going to admit this to this group. None, because, and please solve this. Yes, we will. OK. I, and MetaMask is like <laughs> so, it, it is, I've spent three hours today trying to transfer different currencies between wallets and this and that, and I failed. Um, I had our. <laughs> product or amazing product manager he's like I'll loan you an ETH and I was like I can't ask you to do that like so it's it is I always encounter friction and I do it at the last minute so I am uh, <laughs> so I'm looking for a smooth on-ramp um, for that yes please absolutely <laughs> that, that is our mission you know I always joke about this I think Kevin to answer are you, are you, there are two things I want to touch upon one is um, what she's talking about, we talk, earlier talked about excess, um, NFT being male dominated or, or, or a particular thing, right? I think democratizing that part so it's easy to, ex to access for everybody is the key to unlock every different diverse creator to come into that. Mm -hmm. Whether they're tech savvy, not tech savvy, women, male, um, uh, from Asia, from here, it doesn't really matter because technology is kind of intimidating right now. So one of our missions at Coinbase is to bring the benefits of crypto to the next billion users. And if you've ever used the Coinbase app, you know it takes three steps to buy Bitcoin, and it takes three steps to buy tomatoes in Instacart. It's that easy. <laughs> Literally, it takes three steps to do that, right? And the reason is because we have abstracted a lot of technological complexity and made it very user-friendly. And that's what we're Your doing. onboarding is excellent. Right. So, it's so, excellent. <laughs> so I recently tweeted about this as well, about Coinbase NFT, but that's the mission that we are on to, so we can make it so easy that everybody can participate, whether it's a creator who's trying to create and ask the question, how do I even mint my art? Where do I store this art? Or what, what do I do with this metadata? And my mom, who's very excited about buying NFTs, but feels very intimidated by the technology. The second thing I want to answer is the bubble question that you were asking. So in my opinion, I think you've heard many people say this. I'll say it too. I think 90 plus percent of the NFTs that are there today will go to zero. We'll, so go to, we'll be worthless. We'll be worthless. There's a, there's a huge amount of. But, but as an example, that has nothing to do with NFT. That is a phenomenon that you have seen in every technological innovation. When new technology starts, there can be an explosion of experimentation. And I actually find this exciting that so many people are experimenting with this, right? Because it would be very weird if five of us experimented with it, right? It's so exciting that everybody is experimenting with it. Someone is creating a monkey, someone is creating an ape, someone is creating a shoe, whatever that is, right? And we will figure out collectively as a society what works, right? And that experimentation is the genesis of how technology evolves. It's probably also the genesis of how art evolves, right? Art, art also could be experimental as well. So I'm very excited about that. So if you take a long-term view, Right? NFTs are here to stay, and the use cases of NFT are going to evolve beyond just creating a profile photo of a bored ape or, or, or whatever you want like that. The last thing I'll say is I think some of these apes will be very legendary. So CryptoPunks as an example, Bored Ape Yardcov, I think they have now been ingrained in our culture in many regards. People in NYC NFT were wearing t-shirts, and, and if, when, when someone wears their art, when someone expresses that stuff, it is an extension of what they believe in, it's an extension for what they stand for. It's the extension that they want to take to the other world and say, believe in this as well. So when I see a million users or a bunch of users doing that, that's very exciting to me. That shows that the movement is here to stay. We will see a lot of death of NFTs in the process, you know. But the technology and the artists will experiment and evolve. And hopefully five years from now, if we're doing the same panel, I'm very bullish that people will like, 
we thought NFT is not going to survive. What were we thinking back then? You know, that's not what I, what I believe in. Okay, so the crypto punks and the board apes are going to be okay, but I should not put my 401k <laughs> into the, you know, goofy gooses or whatever <laughs> See, shitty if, NFTs who, people are trying to sell me in my email. That's right. Whoever um, can figure out what those will be will be a genius, but I can't figure it out. Okay. But some of them will survive. Okay. Some of them will. <laughs> okay. Uh, and Claudia, I guess for you, like, I'm curious how you even start to value NFTs. I mean, they're so new. Something that looks totally ridiculous can sell for $10 million. Something that, you know, a, an artist with a track record, you know, and, and lots of experience in other media forms puts together might not be worth anything. So as someone whose job is to, you know, to pick through and figure out which ones are valuable and worth displaying and, and exhibiting and preserving, um, what, how do you do that with NFTs? Well, first off, I think it's too soon to even form an opinion on that. I, I'm following the space with great curiosity and interest because I'm, I'm excited to think about where it might take artists in the near future. Um, Personally speaking, the few sort of like attempts of artists to engage in that space that I find most interesting are those that take the whole concept of the NFT, you know, both. I mean, like really reflect on the, the full range of how it operates in society. What's an, what's an example of that? Well, so, um, for example, Glenn Kaino just announced today uh, a new NFT called the Baton. And it, it's, uh, it's a collaboration with Tommy Smith. Um, and they are releasing, um, I think it's 1,700, 900, don't quote me on the exact number, um, batons that, uh, that are fashioned on the, you know, the um, legendary baton that Tommy Smith had. And there you, but the, what's, what's interesting about that project to me is that they're using the popularity around NFTs and, if you will, the hype around them right now and the willingness of people to invest in it as a means to, uh, as a means for social activism in this case. Yeah. His is an artistic practice that is deeply motivated by social justice. And so they're, they're minting this NFT from the, you know, place of an artist who's very established within the traditional art world, but who's also like, trying to act or activating the activist space and the crypto space to sort of create that synergy around this idea of a which is a philanthropic gesture. And so I, f I find that interesting as a, as a mental exercise, right? Um, so, and, but of course, I mean, there's so much happening in, in that space that, that, uh, that is, uh, you know, I was, that's, I, w I was asking Takeshi earlier, like, how, how has it informed his thinking about his artistic practice? And he spoke about how it has opened up these entirely new doors of creativity for him. And that's what I'm excited to see and explore artists do, you know, but I feel we're still at the very beginning of it. And I'm not, I, you know, I, I, I wouldn't even feel comfortable making a judgment about it right now. I observe it with great acuity and curiosity. But, you know, more from, more from that perspective of intellectual inquiry. If you would like to display my New York Times NFT <laughs> in a feature spot in the De Young, I, I my rates are very reasonable. <laughs> talk okay, we me. can talk about that later. Yeah, yeah. Um, one thing I, I've always been curious about with NFTs is this issue of permanence. So when you create an NFT, and I, I know because I've done this, you the thing that you get is not, you know, the, the art, the, the piece does not actually live on the blockchain. What lives on the blockchain is essentially like a link, like a, you know, a piece of code that points to the file and the file is hosted somewhere else. Um, and that can go down, that, you know, sites right. can break, these links can rot, these hosting services can disappear. And I was talking to someone the other day who said, you know, I asked him, if he was into NFTs, and he said no, because like I, if I buy a painting, I know it's going to be there a hundred years from now. I can I can pass it to my kids and my grandkids, but if I buy an NFT, it might disappear in eighteen months if the hosting service gets acquired and shuts down. So, how do we 
I think about this issue of permanence in NFTs, and, and is this as big a problem as, as I think it could be, um, that all these NFTs that people are paying tons of money for are just all of a sudden going to disappear? I would just say I, I, would feel, I feel better keeping a video than a painting for 100 years. I feel like digitally I could, I could maintain that more easily than, than trying to keep something physical that way. But, um, and like, I can't open files from 15 years ago, you know, <laughs> I don't have a zip drive anymore. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, I just, again, I think, I think it's going to solve itself. Like, I think this is a six month old problem. And I think that inoperative, you know, I think, I think this is the whole question that's happening right now about centralization and decentralization, like I think there will be layers of centralization that start to happen that will feel secure and and I don't know who those players are um, and how that emerges, but I, I, I just think that there will be a solution for, um, for solving for that. I think many of those are here actually, so if I can um, jump in on this one. So Coinbase NFT, if you came and minted over there, you're gonna store your NFT on what is known as IPFS. It's an interplanetary file system. Great name. That's the name. <laughs> interplanetary file system, you know. Uh, and, I, and the idea behind this is that if Coinbase disappears, it's okay that that decentralized layer of IPFS that is running around the world will still be there for many, many years and your art will survive over there. There's another new blockchain called RV that is also solving this problem. So that, like she was saying, there are many decentralized solutions appearing right now. And to Takashi's point, they will survive and that technology will continue to evolve. So I, f I feel like it is a solvable problem, if not already solved in many regards. Um, so that's, that's why I'm hopeful about that. And maybe the D Young. Yeah. Well, maybe you guys have the centralized storage. Right. <laughs> going to say as a museum person that would be very important right. for us maybe that's <laughs> because conservation of course would be one of the main issues that we right. would worry about i'm just picturing like your nft wing of, of your uh, of the museum you know so, you walk in one day there's a row of tvs and it just has like the broken image thing from the <laughs> from the internet it's like oh the artist is, it's like that's the new heist is just you know disappearing the but but I mean I think that this is like an argument that is I mean there's lots of art that probably many people in this room I mean Dan Flavin is a notoriously difficult artist to collect right his fluorescent light bulbs you can't like there's going to be a period you know in 50 years like can you go buy a fluorescent light bulb that you know Jeff Koons has Dr J basketballs that you have to put in there and so I think there is a a physical, there, this is not a new problem for no, not the world of conservation. And I mean, this is like, it's, and I, I it's just gonna require a different uh, tool set. Now I'm just, I'm picturing like art restorers, but they're just like <laughs> carefully stenciling an ape like 50 <laughs> years from now. They're like getting the details just so. Um, so let's just assume that, you know, that we're right to be optimistic about NFTs. And I, I actually am. Like, how does this transform the artist's experience? Um, you know, now the people who are doing NFTs are, are you know, basically they're frontier explorers. They're, they're people who are early adopters. Um, do you think 10 years from now that, you know, all your artist friends will be making NFTs and it will be the rare artist who is doing things on Canvas or other media? Um, or is this gonna be like a, a, a fraction of the art world like it is today? I think it will be a, a most, I hope it will be most people. And I, I think it can't be understated how funding for artists is so huge. Like this, we're talking about people like 99% of people who are making no money on, none, none on digital art that are now making a little bit or like even the, you know, this bubble that we were talking about before, if it pops like 99% of it goes away, that's still 1% is a lot more than, than was ever being made in for digital artists. And everyone that I know, including myself, you, you, you know, we were, you just hustle all the time. That's what the game was. You just, you can sit, maybe sell some things if you're lucky as additions in galleries, traditional galleries as, as video art, but, or new media or any of the, the other kinds of like things that Claudia was talking about too, the performance, all those things, but everybody has some other thing. Everyone, no one could survive. I, I know very few people that could survive in that. And, and I feel very fortunate to have been in the art world but to just survive on, on video, on, on these kinds of things that, that NFTs are allowing digital artists to survive with, or at least start to, be, to have an income. 
So I think that alone, I think, is is can't can't be under underplayed. Despite all the technology, if it just can support artists and get more people making it, then much more interesting work will be made. The more you know, it, I th I think it can, like the same way that crypto just tends to like go in 10x levels. Like it, it can be that level of that many more artists, no no entry levels, no no nothing else that they have. There are no more gatekeepers. They can just put the work up themselves, make a little money and make more work and that's that's going to be the biggest to me that's the biggest most exciting revolution of this, this can thing. i because i think this is a really important part like the stoner cats project right for instance and what is the stoner cats well you project? know the with the the mila and ashton kutcher did lacunas you no know? sure can you explain so Please basically explain. i mean back to board apes but it was a series of it's one of my favorite projects in addition constitution now might be like the top and then this, but um, they released a series of NFTs of cats smoking a joint, and I, if there are any collectors in here, um, and they raised, I think, somewhere around $8 million for this project that then went to fund the production of a TV show, and the only, about cats getting high, I think, presumably. <laughs> I've not seen it yet, um, but the only people that could watch it were people that had the NFT of that. And so like maybe it's not applicable, you know, we don't think about that being a really revolutionary moment, but imagine if it was applied to Game of Thrones. Imagine if it was applied to, you know, some broader access to something. Like, I don't think that model is going away, right? This idea that you, you know, and again, the the part that I wanted to like hit on with what you were saying is an artist now has the ability to reach capital directly, right? So this group basically funded a TV show without having to go to Paramount, Netflix, Amazon, HBO. They were able to raise it from their community. And this is what you're seeing over and over. You know, is it gonna be to the tune of $8 million? I don't know, but it's at least, you know. But I guess to the point about democratization, I mean, they were already famous, right? So that's that's an instance, and a lot of the people who are making but were the board apes. I mean, I I'm just gonna like. Sure, I mean that there, but I think a lot of the people right now who are succeeding in NFTs are people who already had right. substantial followings, in other media. So have we seen the big breakout NFT artists yet, or are no, they mostly still so people who are? Go ahead. No, but I mean, I think to Takeshi's point, I mean, it, it depends on how you define success, because if the NFTs allow or provide a significant self-funding structure for artists who then actually can develop and nurture a career that otherwise they may not be able to, that to me is a huge success. It may not read, you know, we may not read about it in the newspaper because it not, wasn't a single NFT that sold for $69 million, but, but I think we have to think about how do we define success in that sphere uh, truly, apart from the headlines. And also, you know, in your instance, for example, we're not talking about art, right? We're talking about something else. And sort of like, so what, how are we talking about success in relation to what, et cetera, et cetera. I think there's a lot of generalization happening in the conversation around NFTs that is not helpful and very confusing. And I think that's why a lot of people struggle with it. And only because it's an NFT, as you pointed out yourself early on, like not every NFT is meant to be uh, traded as an artwork, <laughs> but there are NFTs who are put out there as artwork. So I think that there needs to be a more nuanced yeah. conversation. Yeah, I, I think it's the $69 million Beeple painting is not gonna be every NFT's future, right? So there's gonna be a range of that success. I'll give you an example. There's an artist by the name of Drift who was on my uh, Biddle Crypto Twitter spaces last week. He was incarcerated, he, he's a great artist, uh, wrongfully incarcerated, he told his story on the, on, the, on the channel, and when he came out, he had no money, et cetera, but all he had was his art. And he stumbled upon NFTs, and he started making um, $1,000, $2,000, $70,000, $150,000, and now he's at a place where he has his own house, he's able to afford a good living, and that is a success story I think many times you will not see in the headline of a, um, an article saying, look, this thing sold for $70,000, right? But a lot of artists are able to find what I call, they make it. They, have, they can make it now because of the 
a global distribution of NFT and the ease of which they can reach their audience very quickly. And NFTs today, by the way, is, we're talking about digital art, but the next movement for NFT is music NFTs. You know, when you think about music, when you think about- Tell us how that works. Yeah, so for example, let's say Spotify plays your song. I, mean, I love Spotify, I'm a user, and so it's not a ding on them or anything. But let's say you're a music uh, musician, you, you have your song playing on, NF, on uh, Spotify. If 25 million plays happen, you're lucky to make $20,000, right? But now imagine if your music is an NFT and every play has some royalty mechanism around it. I'm not saying 20% like some artists would do in digital art, but even if it's 0.05% or whatever that is, right? Whatever the cost is now, you're making music that is sold to the direct audience of yours without an intermediary and you're getting a lot of that royalty coming back to you as well. So as a musician, this is going to be a big revolution in my opinion where you'll be able to build, mint music, control the ownership of that and reach the widest audience around the world without requiring an intermediary over there. So I think those next generation of NFTs are very exciting. The technology is just getting started. And just like today, we we're talking about the bored apes that are the monkeys uh, profile picture or apes profile picture. There is a similar thing about to happen with music as well. That's interesting. Can I ask you one more tech yeah. question and then I want to open it up to questions from the audience. What does this have to do with the metaverse? I mean, I, yes. hear, I hear about the event. Oh my God. I just know they're connected in some way. I love way, metaverse. Because yeah. the only two words in my inbox for the last month have been metaverse and NFTs. That's right. Um, so tell us how this concept of the metaverse is connected to what we're seeing with NFTs. Yeah, great or if question. They are. Yeah, so there's a lot of um, uh, Google search. If you do it right now, you can see the trending word is metaverse. You know, meta or metaverse, whichever you want. And I think I'll use an analogy from what you were saying earlier. Um, I think imagine more and more we're living a life on internet in some in online form. I, I should say the online form. We are on the phone, we are on websites, we are watching movies, we are in video games, etc. Now the prediction is that we will be living in a virtual reality world of some sort, a world where we all, like we're sitting over here, will sit like this, but there will be our avatar or our NFTs, not the real world but the virtual world. And the prediction is, or the hypothesis is that in the next 10 years, more and more of us will be there. So I'll give an example from her, which was the museum. Imagine you are, I don't know, somewhere in the world, but you can't come to the museum in San Francisco. There's a beautiful piece of art over there, a digital art, right? Imagine you're in metaverse where you go to your laptop, your computer, you sign into this beautiful metaverse that looks very digitally like the replica of your physical world. And you're actually able to view that art even though you're sitting in Africa and that art is actually by an artist sitting in. Wait, isn't that just called Google Images? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so Google Images probably is the V.01 version of Metaverse probably, you know, it's like very- So it's Google early. Images strapped to my face. It's, it's pretty much, yeah, okay. that's the visual that comes to people's mind. And I, I don't know what the form it'll take, but there are lots of experimentation happening. So there's a show you, S-H-O-Y-U, Metaverse that recently launched. And you can actually go over there on your laptop and, and walk into a museum like a real life museum depicted virtually, you can walk over there and there is actually the Board Ape Yacht Club on the wall, right there. And you can see it and you feel like you're in a museum. So the world of virtual reality and augmented reality is catching up really fast. And what you're gonna see is all of us living in a world, not living in a world, but rather participating in a world where the things we do in the real world could also be extended to the virtual world. And it'll become very hard to distinguish, at least in my mind, what is real and what's, versus what is not, and people will be spending a lot more time over But it. lest this sounds so scary, because I, I think a lot of people here are like, oh my this God. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I just became Amish while you were I, talking no, about I, that. <laughs> but. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it is scary. <laughs> But it's exciting. But no, no, but I think we are already living. Zoom is a version of the metaverse. Right. Like as, not as well thought out and as monetized right. as some people are trying to make it. And, but I think we're already living, you know, in that, whether it's Twitter spaces or Clubhouse or, or video games. Zoom or what? Games. Games, If, if yes. you play games online, if you play Roblox, any of the video games, your kids are playing video games, yeah. they are literally in the metaverse. The metaverse is called a game. You know, you can buy guns to shoot somebody if you go for a war. You can buy cars, you can buy accessories. And again, this is a technology that looks very, very, like, bad. <laughs> I know, Kevin, you're looking at me like, what the heck is this guy talking about? But like, <laughs> Oh, the guns, that yeah, really sold me on right. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sign best, me up. 
what, what if I told you you can get the Nike special edition shoes that you can wear in the NFT as well as well? Well, I'll and look I cool think, while I'm getting shot in the metaverse. I think one of the pro <laughs> for me, like the matter, it's the one that you know, just as a translator, like of where it you start to see, like so Dolce and Gabbana sold digital earrings, right? They don't, I think they sold like five million dollars worth of digital earrings for people to wear on their Zoom calls. So just let that sink in, right? Nike's trying to sell shoes, digital shoes. You're gonna have like your cool shirt, you like, and I think for the art world, you're also gonna get to a point, we all sit in front of like our beautiful art and we're like, look at my backdrop. And like, that's gonna become like passe in a little bit. Like, and you're gonna have to have your digital piece. Right, you're gonna have to have like your ape hanging out in yeah, the background. Kinda. Yeah, kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like I'm like here. It's attacking you, but it's not. You I know? did see <laughs> see people at this conference in, in New York who had made their very high priced NFTs into their Apple watch face. That's right. So it's like become a new flex, like you just pull out your Apple watch, and it's like, oh, that's my CryptoPunk. Uh, it's yeah. 3.30, <laughs> um, yeah. very dystopian. Um, I well, also, oh, sorry. Yeah, go I ahead. Just, the other thing I'd like to just add to that, the, the idea of the metaverse compared to in, in this crypto time is I think one of the things that always I, I was drawn to NFTs is, is, is thinking about um, these, these web two applications like uh, Instagram, which always made me like really feel stressed out. I, anytime I put things on there, I'm like, I'm giving this content to a company and I'm not getting anything out of it, you know, except and except being fed other things that <laughs> we found out, like the, the, the data that would make me really angry or whatever it was feeding me. But but then the, I think it's interesting right now that the, the there is this moment where the, clearly there's a, a, going to be a push to, to control that metaverse. And I think I think what made NFT so popular for me and I think a lot of people is taking back that that ownership, taking it, bringing it back to a decentralized platform, bring it back to people and not having it be controlled completely by a, these companies that we've right. seen what happens when they control these, th these things in the Web2 environment. So. Yeah. Well, anything that helps artists make more money is cool by me. Um, <laughs> let's give a round of applause to our amazing panelists tonight. Thank you. And, uh, and we can open it up to some questions. I don't know if who's in charge here wants to pass a mic, or we just want people to stand up, or how do you want to do it? Oh, okay, great. Great panel, thank you so much. Um, Vanity Fair yesterday published an article about how Miramax is suing Quentin Tarantino for his NFT sale of the original Pulp Fiction script. Now, aside from the fact that it's a shameless money grab, could you talk a little bit about IP? Who wants to field the IP question? Oh, no. Okay. No, I mean, I think it's, I, I listen, I think it's incredibly, I'll talk about it from the art world. Um, we, you know, the way of controlling IP in the art world was a very centralized group who would monitor catalog images and you'd send a request and they had a fax machine and they maybe had like, that wasn't, you know, it's, it's a very, so I think one is it's not actually, advan you know, helping advance the artist's goals of distribution and monetization. Um, and then I think there's a fundamental question of like, who owns? that intellectual property, right? And I think we're now in an invite, like, is it, it, I mean, it shouldn't just be Miramax. And I think this technology has like, is gonna unfurl that conversation, right? If you create something, um, you know, you, and you're part of a, an ongoing um, upside cycle, like there is gonna be a mechanism for you to capture that. Um, so I love that that's, I hadn't heard that that was going on, but it's great. So I, I think it's foundational I, I heard to an, NFTs. Quentin Tarantino at, at this event in New York talking about his NFTs, and I don't think he understood what he <laughs> he was doing with them either. So, um, but yeah, I think it's an it's an interesting question because you know right now anyone here could take a Disney character and make right. an NFT of it and sell it, and probably get a very angry yep. you know letter from the Disney legal department. But there's no real mechanism to prevent that. But is anybody follow? It's like the Emily Ratajkowski. Example too, and I think like she is transforming. I mean, an amazing conversation about her image, who's in control. You know, Richard Prince, the great appropriator, what his painting meant. Um, photographers that took work of her, like, and she's reclaiming that. And I think Taylor Swift, amazing. You know, kind of re-releasing her album. Um, these are things that are flipping all of that on its head. Um, and I'm 
I'm here for it. And don't um, forget Disaster Girl. Disaster Girl. Yeah. Tell us. Yeah, tell us about Disaster Girl. No, but I mean, it's, uh, I mean, obviously there's a lot of room for abuse right now, right, in that, in that sense, in terms of infringement on copyright. But, um, well, Disaster Girl is the, the original image that was the basis of a meme that has been reproduced. It's the meme with the, the girl, girl and there's in the front of house the burning. House. In yeah. 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 And I mean, that's an example of an image. And she sold that as an NFT. She sold that as an yeah. NFT and it paid for her college education. And it was also a way for her to reclaim, to reclaim an image of her that was obviously taken, I guess, by her father as she was a young child. But you could say that she, she always felt really alienated by her image having become this phenomenon, this meme that, that went around the world. And, and so that also was an act of reclamation that I actually found at the time one of the most interesting things happening in that space. Absolutely. Other questions? I can't see anything, so I'm not going to be the person to uh, pass the mic. This might be like a really layman question about how the artist maintains ownership or royalty, but can someone explain how that works? Like how, like how is it exactly that you sell something to a community of X number of people who buy into it? And then like, what do you get to keep? And like, how does that multiply? Or like, how do you stay part of that over time? Happy to answer that one. So as a creator, uh, you have the ability to dictate what hap how much money you get every time a sale happens. So whether it's primary sale and after the primary sale, secondary sale, meaning I selling it to her and she's selling it to somebody else, you can set that in the smart contract or the technology itself. And as a result of that, if because digital art on the blockchain, nobody has to be an intermediary, nothing. The code makes sure that you and your wallet always gets filled with that royalty that comes every time the, the art is being sold. So that's another beauty of the technology, which in the traditional world is very hard to enforce. You need some intermediary, you need some, some policing, et cetera. But here the code will make sure. So if you, for example, if you mint your NFT, you can specify that I want 20% of every secondary sale volume that happens, right? or 5% or 1%. You can do 100% too, but then nobody will buy it. <laughs> you know, like, okay, everything is going to her, right? But uh, if, you, if you choose the right amount of royalty as the sales happen, you as an artist do not have to worry about enforcement. You don't have to worry about intermediary, the smart contract, or the technology will make sure that your wallet gets filled every time the sale happens. It's a very powerful mechanism. Takashi, has that happened with any of your art? Have you had secondary sales of any of your NFTs? Not yet, but I'm, I think it, it, I'm thinking more now, actually, part of changing my work for NFTs and, and thinking about, like, larger editions and bringing in more collectors and making them less expensive, encouraging secondary market, which w that is something that I don't think exists much at all in the, in the traditional art world. So it is something like I'm excited about and it's great. And I, you know, I, 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 I trust that it will happen if, if one of the people who've bought my works sell, resells it. So, but yeah, not yet. I think there's a 10% royalty on my New York Times thing that I wasn't able to remove. So if anyone would like to pay $1.7 million <laughs> for a copy of my story that charity would be very happy uh, other questions thank Can't you guys that. this is amazing I'm so happy to see you guys um, I just want to ask one question so AI is an avalanche and it's a coming fast <laughs> AI artificial intelligence and all that ethics and everything that comes with it um, how does crypto and NFT platforms in particular think of algorithms and AI, and are there any concerns? Who wants to take that one? That's a tough one. That's a tough one. Uh, that's a good, good question. I think, uh, uh, so, so there's no, um, I think the AI world is, and crypto world are still not that connected as much as you would imagine in the traditional world it is. So we have time to figure this out, <laughs> but a lot of smart people are thinking about it. Uh, I think right now the best way to think about this is it is truly, uh, the algorithms haven't taken over. There's the artist control. Artists control who they distribute to, artists control who they're not distribute to. As an artist, you can actually blacklist a wallet and you can say, my art cannot be sold to Kevin Rose's wallet, as an example, you know? I would love to sell it, but like, I assume I wanted to block that. I didn't want your art anyway. You know? <laughs> but uh, there's an ability. So what I was trying to say is like, you don't have to worry about the algorithm just yet, 
but right now you are in full control. You get to decide which chain you minted on, you get to decide who do you sell it to, and you get to decide how much royalties you, you take right now. I have a, also very a, another sort of simplistic answer to that. In one of our early, one of a very good childhood friend of mine who was very early in crypto, said to me like his children will always all learn art because it's the one thing that can't be replaced. And I think, and I encourage you guys, there was a great podcast um, that Tim Ferriss did with uh, last, last week, two weeks ago, I don't know, but it's really long, but I encourage, it's, it's amazing. And it really talks about how this is the golden era of creativity. And I believe that. I think that there is so much AI will do and will replace, but it will never replace this and sort of independent thought and creativity. And we've now figured out maybe the beginnings of a structure that can capitalize it um, and make it sustainable um, and make it a profession, um, you know, whether it's TikTok or it's a distribution platform. But like we are, I think we are about to see creativity become um, protected with AI. And that wasn't your question, Ms. Rose. Oh, see, I think the exact opposite. I think, I mean, I, I think that a lot of these generative projects, so what, what you're talking about when you're talking about a generative NFT is like a, literally like an algorithm that is creating art on its own. And a lot of these are selling for a lot of money. And so NFTs are sort of abstracting away some of the human labor behind it. Obviously, there will be human artists making NFTs, but it sort of levels the playing field for bots, too, that can come in and, kind and of, create but the, their but own the art. The bots aren't going to create community. I don't know. Let's like let's see where the, the bot community. Well, yeah. The bot community. <laughs> and I would say it's the, in, as far as generative, it's it's the way of looking at the creativity behind create like how those systems are working. Like it's artists still creating the systems that then make the work that then is ultimately generated. But it's still an, an artist that's creating that, in, like in art blocks or generative music, those kinds of things. So it's, it's still, still the human creativity is still a big factor in that, even though it's being generated ultimately by other things. You know. So let's check back in five years and see if there are any artists, <laughs> human artists left. Um, other questions? Nothing over here. I'm definitely still struggling to wrap my head around NFTs, full disclosure, but I think listening to this conversation, it feels to me like there is a tension between community, democratization, decentralization, and then some other topics that have come up like barriers to entry or, or some elements of like pay to play a little bit in this space. So, and I wonder if you can talk about some of the ethical trade-offs that relate to that relate to those topics because I, I think they they feel um, they just they it just feels like there's some underlying tension between NFTs who they're for who owns them uh, how, and also I think you've all expressed different perspectives you know both from an artistic a curatorial a commercial perspective on on where they fit into society but um, if you could talk about that tension I'd be curious to get your perspectives on it. Don't everyone rush to answer. <laughs> I think maybe just it's it might just be like an early stage, and uh, to me it's just it's, it's it's just an exciting. There is a lot of tension, and there's the way that these things f f seem to move is on a daily basis, sometimes hourly, of things changing and, and new new opportunities coming up, new new ways of thinking about how to be creative and and uh, ex you know work within these mediums. So. Um, I'm not sure that answers the question, but like as far as those, those tensions, I think I think that's what's adding to the excitement of this moment, and 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 I, I welcome it. It's 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 almost the same thing with the cryptocurrencies themselves. I mean, that's they're right. so crazy. It's like uh, investing in them is just a wild ride, you know. And it's it's but it's also really exciting, and it it, it is um, it can be empowering. And, yeah. But I am curious, since you're in that world, you know, how, it, it seems to me from some of the podcasts <laughs> seems to be very, that I've also listened to that the crypto community also is very is very protective of itself That's and right. sort of um, to what extent do they even want somebody like me in there you know who, who yeah. is a newcomer who you know is trying to learn the ropes about what it takes to participate 
in that community. So to, to what degree is it welcoming and, and open? I mean, I'm, I'm curious about that too. For me, I had no social media. And when I started, the first thing that the guys at Foundation, they told me, they're like, you've got to have Twitter because that's what everyone wants. Everyone who's doing NFTs, crypto, they all do. T you, they'll use Twitter for some reason. And so I, like, I started Twitter, and it is the most positive, like welcoming group that I've w like experienced. Certainly on social media, but I'd say like across a lot of, of just my experiences in general. So I'd say like that should definitely not be a barrier for people. Like just join in, you know. And it is it is pretty easy right now to just get buy some <laughs> like buy some Ethereum on Coinbase and start a MetaMask, and you can join in collecting. And and it's very I think that part is, to me, has been just personally been really welcoming, and and I, and I was coming from like a place that maybe they wouldn't have been welcoming, being in like sort of another art, you know, this kind of gallery art world. So, yeah, yeah I was curious if if you had personally experienced any tension as an artist coming from the art world into the crypto world versus crypto native artists, so to speak. I mean, did you did you find there any? I, ha I haven't yet, and I was expecting that the whole time. You know, I was right. expecting to get more of that, and I haven't, just personally. And, and um, it's it's been really great. And I, I, but I've also I I just love it. I mean, I do really do love working this way in the community. So I feel like an ad instant like advocate too. So I don't know. Maybe, I don't yeah, know. I think I think there's just to add a couple of things. I think you're right that there is a a perception to some degree of reality as well where. The people who brought this movement, the, the crypto natives that you're referring to, do believe that the rules have been set, you know, this is how things should be, and the outside people who are coming in probably don't understand those rules or don't want to play by those rules. So you do see a little bit of that, we call it in crypto, the maximalist. There's a Bitcoin maximalist who believe Bitcoin is everything and nothing else matters. Similarly, there might be crypto native maximalists who think that. But I would say far and beyond, they are the smaller part. Mm -hmm of the broader community. The broader community wants to welcome everybody, both collectors and creators, to come and partake in this revolution that's happening around how to create decentralized art, how to reach billions of people through that art, uh, through that technology, and then hopefully one day be able to create uh, careers out of it when they're starting over this. So I would say they're very welcoming. The two things I highly recommend everybody who's getting started is become users of Discord, because that's where that community hangs out. And if you haven't heard of Discord, it's like, uh, a, a, ch a chat slash grouping, group messaging app. And the second one is Twitter. Like he was saying, there's a, there's a term called crypto Twitter or NFT Twitter. Everybody who does anything with NFT is on Twitter right now. So no, I, think, I think NFTs are responsible for moving the art world from Instagram into Twitter. That's right. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. So those will be the great places to start. I think we have time for one more question. Um, anyone want to be our last questioner? Hello. Um, just more of a commentary because I'm quite a newbie to NFTs, um, but excitingly um, started working on a project of my own. I'm actually from the traditional art world. I was um, a knit mod specialist at Christie's and a Chinese painting specialist. And I can tell you that having immersed myself in spaces, it is the most welcoming space I've ever been a part of. It's pretty phenomenal. Uh, apart from the fact that whenever I'm in a space, someone's like, hey dude, or like him, they have no idea. Um, so my movement is actually to make antiques cool or sexy is my tagline. And it's amazing because I'm in these spaces and I'm talking to people from around the world about my first exhibition, which is on Chinese Genoa ceramics from like 960 AD. And I'm reaching all these audiences that I've never been able to reach before as a Christie specialist. And it's to me that audience, that community is like so pivotal. It's actually been incredibly um, eye-opening for me. And then secondly, you know, um, in my spare time or in our spare time, this is Rob also, he's been working on a side project of ours, is we're working on um, a kind of a tent, well, it's an AK project. But with our other NFT project, we're actually donating the proceeds back to kind of creating an artist fund for NFT artists. Because actually it is pretty difficult to enter the space and mint and all these gas fees it can actually accumulate. So um, just to share a bit of my experience there, it's actually been um, a really wonderful journey. And I've only been in there for one month, but it's um, pretty cool. So yeah. I'm pumped about all of you trying to mint an NFT tomorrow. It'll be amazing, you know? And all of us should experiment with it. I'll, I'll leave everybody with one thought, which is that 
there are more things to be figured out than there are already figured out. Nobody has all the answers. And the only way to figure those things out is through experimentation. So the more of us who do experiments, some of them will survive, some of them will not survive. But whatever survives, that's upon which we build upon, and that's how technology and art evolve. So I'm really excited when all of you jump in with both feet to try out NFTs. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you.